Well, that's easy because uh, obviously, Kaz, you've been reading our paper on rehabilitation, <laughs> and we particularly mentioned the purposes of the Sentencing Act, but really at the moment they're not being achieved. And we will be looking at how that can be achieved, how prisoners can be rehabilitated if programs, adequate programs, are provided. So thank you very much for that question. <laughs> It's my pleasure, I think. <laughs> Can I ask what an adequate, adequate program is? You know, that, that's the whole point of doing a review to determine, firstly, what's being delivered and is it adequate. Mm. Now, I don't profess to be an expert in rehabilitation, but what I can say from our initial inquiries that what's being delivered in some prisons is quite different to other prisons for the same supposed outcome. And that the department, and you'll see this in the discussion paper, the department is not measuring success rates rather than measuring programs delivered. So they say we, we delivered 100 programs. They can't tell you if any of those were successful. And there's no coordination of that across the prison system either. So, a, a very good point. I've got some reservations about the use of the word rehabilitation because it presumes that the person is going back to a former position that he or she was in. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we're looking at, for instance, uh, the concerns in the community about Islamic youth, I would think the best form of crime prevention there would be access to good education, ac access to perhaps tertiary education afterwards, and then access to a career path. That would be the best form of crime prevention that could occur for people at risk like that. But, you know, a vast majority of people in prison, you know, don't need rehabilitation, they need habilitation in terms of their missed out often in, in terms of access to good primary, secondary schooling, uh, and they don't have a career path. So if, if we're building communities, as we're having to in Victoria, 2% a year, much higher than the national rate, and we haven't even, the state government uh, admitted recently they haven't even got land for schools in those areas. And now, after the houses are built, chasing land to buy land to build schools, uh, I mean, that's where the, the whole priority thing is so obviously out of building. There's also <clears throat> the issue that um, community organisations get confronted with this question of, like, have you been successful in rehabilitating this person when? Um, well, for one, prisons exist in a complete vacuum of accountability in terms of the 56% uh, recidivism rate. If we had a 56% failing rate, we wouldn't be getting funding mm -hmm. to get those prison keys. But also for, for women, particularly because that's who we work with, um, we know that women going into prison are going into prison from situations of extreme disadvantage and leaving prisons to situations of extreme disadvantage and also discrimination on top of that. And so all of these things of like the criminogenic need or it's like the prison's response or the you know the community the corrections response is that women need housing and that's a corrections thing or um, drug and alcohol care and that's a corrections thing. Like those are just basic human services and if people had those things, not because they're criminal mm -hmm. But because they're part of our community, then there would be so many people going to prison in the first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everyone's touched on the issue of the need to um, have the agenda focused on self-reduction youth before prison and mm -hmm. not having prisons or policing in prisons traditionally as the primary response to a whole range of um, social injustice. And rather looking at what infrastructure we want to build um, in our communities to support the development and um, human value of every citizen, not just a few. And I think the danger of moving to um, you know big conversations about how we can fix um, the prison system goes back to what Taryn just talked about, and that is that in fact prison system is working entirely as it was intended to work, which was is to warehouse and ascribe notions of other to a whole range of people in the community that um, we don't want. 
in our community that we need to block away and not see and not deal with and not um, think through um, adequately what would be the best responses for the individual and for the community as a whole. I think the um, issue of prison as last resort, you know, it's just gone. <laughs> It's like, does that even exist in the narrative anymore? Prison as last resort? I don't think so. I think what we have is a dominant narrative of prison as the primary response, and we have to change that. You know, I think the other thing is accepting that there's overcrowding, and that will continue perhaps for years to come, and accepting that prison officer numbers will never be adequate, that training will perhaps never be ideal, to me, the most important thing that even with all of that, the prisons are transparent and accountable and not frightened and hiding behind locked doors. And I look at when I reviewed Woomera Detention Centre and I've never seen such an unpleasant place guarded by protective services officers with firearms who could never use them. I said, why are you carrying guns? You, you'll never use them because these are administrative detainees. Have you any instructions about it? And the officer in charge said, no, but we will by the time you leave. <laughs> um, to, to have a prison system where people um, welcome inspection, where they don't just put fresh flowers and a sign out the front because you're visiting on a particular day, where there's interaction with the community, where um, prison visitors are welcome and feedback is accepted. I think then you're going to have a safer and a better environment, even with all the problems. Uh, my name's Andrew Fraser. I used to be a lawyer, but then a drug addict, and then a prisoner, and uh, I've been around the block a few times. I've got to take issue with the last question that relates to what do we do about getting somebody into prison? Well, once they're in prison, the prison system's got to deal with the hand that's been dealt. And it can't go back, looking back to the length of the period of the life of the person. It's got to deal with the person they've got in there. The first thing is that work appears to be, from my observations, and that will end with any prison officer. So they should start by doing their job. The second thing is, and staggered me, was the complete and utter lack of education in jail, particularly for the Indigenous young people. The number that came to me with a one-line letter from their solicitors saying your case has been adjourned and their inability to read that was breathtaking and I was truly shocked by that. If I can talk about education just for a moment, I'm lucky enough to have two degrees and I had five years to go and I thought well I'll do another degree, that'll help. Oh no, not, not as simple as that. You have to make an application uh, to be assessed for suitability for further education. Okay, so I filled out the form, and then I asked, and I asked, and then I asked, and how long until I was assessed for my suitability? One year. And I was assessed by a young person who would maybe been 23. He came to me and uh, he said, I'm here to assess you. I said, is that right, what are your qualifications? And he didn't answer, and this is the absolute truth. He took out the blank form, signed it and gave it back to me and said your assessors look suitable. <laughs> that went absolutely no further at Port Phillip and I was there for three years. So, so much for doing another degree. Now, one thing that did cross my mind that might be a benefit particularly to the Indigenous kids is that there was one kid in particular I remember that spent, in the five years I was in jail, he came back four times. Now talk about recidivism. Bang them up, put them out. Somebody said use the term warehousing before. And that's all that happens in jail. It's a warehouse. Now let's just get that perfectly clear in everyone's mind. You can dress it up and bullshit all your life. That's what it is. It is a warehouse. Nothing more, nothing less. And jail re rehabilitation is frankly an oxymoron. People don't like to hear these things, but they're the facts. I've seen it. I thought I knew all about it because I've been in just about every jail in Australia as a solicitor. But once the door slams behind you, trust me, it's a different world. And it is violent. It is demeaning and it is pointless. Now, 
there's only two things at work, education and education. Everything else is so far distant second, it doesn't matter. But we're not going to get anywhere unless we can change the political will. These sort of forums are great, but we're preaching to the converted here. We've got to get the message out into the community so that Herald's son suddenly starts going, wait a minute, this is crazy. This is costing us a fortune. What are we getting for it? Nothing. We're not having a prison-led recovery in this state, are we? That's what we're looking at. A prison-led recovery. How good's that? Australia, the smart country. That's not very smart when I went to school. Anyway, I just wanted to make those points. I've got it off my chest now. <laughs> I, I did read just the other day as I was thinking about this, that California has finally decided that it can't build prisons to get out of its difficulties. Mm. It just simply can't keep on that's building them. And so it's now putting money into the community and that's where the money should be going. We should be stopping people from being offenders in the first place. Yeah. Um, I've got a question uh, about alternative forms of accountability that requires a little bit of context. Quite often at the Community Legal Centre you feel like you're working at the meeting of the waters. On one hand you might be representing a, a victim of crime, another you might be de defending someone who's been charged uh, with something. And uh, from a policy perspective, for example, one of the things that we were concerned about with the parole review was that it, it perhaps wasn't broad enough because we had had a client who was raped by a man who, uh, was, uh, who was on electronic home detention and a watch. And, uh, and that uh, obviously was no uh, deterrent to her being raped. Uh, but that particular circumstance uh, fell out of the ambit of that because he wasn't on parole. He, he was subject to a different form of supervision. Um, anyway, we, we quite often see this in the family violence arena. And a few months ago, we had a similar uh, seminar with um, an Ari Freiberg spoke from the Sentencing Advisory Council, and they'd recently done a report about um, uh, looking at trends of sentencing for, fam for people who breached family violence orders, intervention orders. And they had tracked an increase in, uh, in the imposition of fines and uh, more heavy sentences for uh, perpetrators. And so my question was, okay, so what, what are we learning from that? What, what do we know about the, the, what impact that's having on that offending behaviour afterwards? And the answer, of course, was we don't know. Don't know if it's good or bad or otherwise. Uh, and so the question was, well, like, why are you advocating for that position, that, that you should have more uh, you know, heavier sentences and so on? And the answer was, well, that would bring us at least into parity with uh, similar offences that don't occur in the family environment. So assaults, for example, that occur on the street, um, which I can, I can understand that logic at one level, but mm -hmm. another seems pretty perverse. And, and it seemed to me that uh, in, in this whole conversation, especially in the family violence arena, where we need to think quite creatively about alternative forms of accountability or effective accountability for the women and kids who are at risk, mm -hmm. there, there's a real risk of rushing to uh, prison, incarceration, heavier sentences, when, when it has no impact. But, you, but at the same time, you feel like there is no alternative but to do this because we have to send a strong message. Um, and you talked about how our responsibility as communities can't be just, you know, uh, outsourced. Mm. Um, I, I was just wondering about views about alternative forms of accountability and how to have that conversation, especially in a, the family violence context, which is obviously really ramped up and crescendo at the moment, and, and all power to it. It's fantastic. If I could just add an addendum to that. It's made more complicated by the removal of suspended sentences as an option for now all courts from the 1st of September. In fact, we were so concerned about that that the previous Ombudsman wrote to the Attorney General and invited him to consider deferring it for 12 months whilst the prison system and everything else caught up, if you like, and other alternatives were being considered. But that, that hasn't happened yet. So, that's, that's true, but what are the alternatives? Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with a magistrate um, before he headed off from Golden Valley to uh, an, another area, and he just said to me, Kaz, what are we going to do? 
you've seen and how I try and use suspended sentences as part of the carrot and the stick. He said, what are we going to do now? And, and that was a magistrate and a man of a lot of experience. So there you go. I mean, I think um, in, in the last, I think I've talked about it, in the last two years, acting for families of people murdered. Might need to speak up, Karen. Most of that, most of the families, the murders occurred in the context of family violence, long histories of family violence. So now acting for Rosie Batty in terms of Luke, the inquest which is going on, I mean, we act, but these are my personal views. Um, that there is nothing in the police responses and in the criminal justice prison responses that um, at all challenged or held to account the ingrained systemic patriarchal entitlement to violence, control, and killing. There was nothing that I've seen in 21 years in the prison system. I can't identify a single instance, a single instance, where someone, a man has been spoken to about their violence in a way that has deeply engaged and challenged the mentality, their history, and, and the whole societal normalisation of male violence against women and children. I, I, and, and it's almost impossible to see that because the institution of, of prison is one of patriarchal violence. What do you think strip searching is? You know, and, and it is something that says we will use force whenever we want to for whatever for whatever ends. And we will have regulation and laws, but in the end we'll use violence and you'll cough it or us. You know, so it actually reproduces, you know, the 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 entitlement to violence and control, the patriarchal, misogynistic and you know, entitlement. Um, rather than in any way having a capacity to hold individuals to account beyond caging and warehousing, you know, and allowing someone to develop an even greater victim mentality that they are entitled to violence, because look at what's been happened, what's happened to me because I'm an innocent party here. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. So, um, you know, and, and, and ploughing millions and billions, in fact, into systems that don't challenge entitlement to violence, don't address accountability, don't address long histories of violence and our, our and our, our the impact of violence in our lives, you know, um, is is really folly because it deprives us of the resources and the capacity and even the thinking, the thinking work that we need to do to think about new systems and institutions and processes that actually do function to take apart that entitlement to violence and control and especially coercive control and not to have it sanctioned by a criminal justice system in other ways you know so I think you know we need to think about safety and containment in ways that aren't violent that don't sanction violence and actually bring about a deeper sense of contesting and confronting and holding <coughs> violence and harm accountable. That might be historical violence in the life of someone who's using violence, or it might be very present or both. But until we're able to speak about that, and uh, you know, because it's very easy to shut down the conversation about violence and about prison by talking about a few people, Adrian Bailey, Ivan Malak, Julian Knight, and our capacity to think critically is shut down because we see, we see it huge incarceration system justified by the, the bringing about of a few monsters. And we don't even think about what happens in those, those men's lives. You know, and, and, and the societal system that has authorised, you know, um, endemic violence. So we need to do that deeper work and we need to have the resources to build about responses that aren't relying on violence in itself or the threat thereof. Chris. I, I fully agree with what you've said, but I think that we also have to be fully accountable, all of us, with it's okay when there's um, sexual violence and external violence, but there's often violence which is just under, under yeah. in terms of tone, in terms of threats, in terms of all sorts of like, look at our own Prime Minister who's going to shirt front someone. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. it, that, the thing is, 
that can give us evidence. It's accepted as well by funding, and that is a real concern. That 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 language is violent, and we have to change it, and we have to call it for what it is. Yes, and I think you've just put your finger on the most important response from the community, which is to see it as a whole of the community response to violence at every level in the community, and to say no to that violence. And in terms of an alternative, I was just thinking about Peter's question and, and wanting to respond to that as well, is um, I, I think that the to put the focus on accountability and not put the focus on women and children who are being violated, who are um, being abused is really dangerous because that and that's what's happening. So all the resources get drafted into policing and prisons and we forget that probably the most important thing that could change a woman's life um, in terms of being free from violence is economic security and the ability to be able to walk from a man or any person who is perpetrating violence against them and um, to know that when they walk, that they, they, they themselves and their children are going to be um, able to survive in that other way. So it's about looking at social and economic rights of women more so than looking at the accountability of the perpetrator. It's about de uh, or neutralising the power of the oppressor rather than, um, you know, through making women, supporting women to be independent and able to walk. Thanks, Sam. I've got another question here. Um, and I'd like to pose it because it was posed just two weeks ago by a, a senior magistrate that I know. Isn't it useful to give a young offender a short, sharp period inside to shock them out of their bad ways? Jail's a deterrent, right? Two years ago, the New Zealand Ombudsman did a review of the death of a 17-year-old in custody. Uh, what happened, he illegally used his parents' car. The parents complained to the police and said they wanted him uh, given a lesson. He was held in custody, uh, transferred to uh, weekend detention, and it was murdered in the prison van. So, you know, there's got to be alternatives. I'm surprised magistrates are still even suggesting that. Uh, I remember 25 years ago, Sir John Stark, who was the pre precursor to Ari Freiburg, was doing an inquiry on sentencing, and uh, I came in as a witness, uh, and he told the assistant, turn that tape recorder off. And he said, now, Peter, tell me, what does happen when these young boys go to prison? Is that the most experienced sentencer in the state, Sir John Stark, who did Ronald Ryan's trial, you know, age 65, 70, heading the inquiry for sentencing, having to ask me that question. When I was working out at the NIC, I used to take county court judges there on a Saturday morning in Mufti, one by one. And they'd been there as barristers. Um, they'd been there on tours when the place was cleaned up, you know, beforehand, as prison administrators do, they clean up when they've got important business. But I'd bring these guys, mostly guys in those days, uh, county court judges, uh, and sit them on the, uh, on the bench outside the property store and leave them on their own for 12 months or two years or 20 years, when they don't even know the currency. But, you know, if you put a vulnerable 18-year-old, except in Queensland, uh, if you put a vulnerable 18-year-old in prison, 
who hasn't had a stable male figure in his life, whose life's all uncertain, that young man or that young girl even will turn criminals into heroes and will very quickly adopt a, a positive role model of someone who's got a criminal identity. Uh, and the Scared Straight program, one of the most popular with the polys here in Victoria and in America, of course, it was so ridiculous. It was precisely what it was doing, bringing kids from you know, 15, 16 year olds and putting them side by side with these serious criminals. I mean, for a kid who's going to be ducks at the school, who made a mistake, that smart kid who comes from a stable family would think rationally and see what's going on in prison and move in that direction. But it's not the potential ducks of the schools that were coming into prison. It was a kid who was truanting from school, who was dropping out from school. It's completely irrational. I go back to your presentation. You've got to understand what the prison system's about. Uh, but there are good programs going back to the domestic violence. I went to a prison in Sweden 25 years ago and it worked. And it was a prison for men who were violent towards women. Uh, and it was small, and there are successful programs. I mean, if you're gonna have people in prison, at least try to have programs that work. What do we do? The first penalty we impose on anyone for dirty urines or whatever, loss of contact visits. As Soon as you start taking away contact visits, their connectedness to the most important people in their lives are fragmented. Uh, and we, we insist on taking away contact visits as a form of penalty. Three months for first offence, six months, 12 months, whatever it is these days. It's the very most important thing, keep the connectedness. Uh, because prison actually breaks down all those potentially supportive relationships. So the whole purpose of the environment is not to prevent crime. It's actually to control it and manage it. It's a growth industry. Yes, thanks very much. and everybody seems to know what's going on in that situation. The other prisoners and the pr prison officers and everybody looks the other way. And the class up. Pardon? And the class up. Yeah, oh, everybody. And uh, the, so the young person goes, stumbles out, complains, what happens? He's moved and the rapist stays. And so the next young person that comes into this, that unit, oh, I'll look after him and may let it happen again. And so it goes. Someone at the back had their hand up. This lady's got a hand up for them. Okay. One of the issues for Victoria is that we don't have a stamp of conviction standard, and we're all fully sexual in the way in Queensland, which um, the police regulations and you know, decide to do that, and they do often. Um, we work a lot with um, women um, who are experiencing criminal record discrimination in a whole range of different areas, including access to space, which is one that always shocks people over the years. They can't get into a space now because they have a criminal record. And it's um, about women not being able to access, take courses where you need to be able to undergo placements with club support. So their argument is there's no point us um, accepting these students into a state course if they can't complete their placement because they won't pass the course. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a huge problem in Victoria and it's a growing problem because there are very few places that you can now work anywhere in the Victorian community where you won't be asked to undertake a um, police check. Mm -hmm. And in fact, again, it's a business now. So we've got prison checks and all these different organisations that are now actually benefiting, making money from conducting police checks on behalf of employers. But we absolutely agree with you. We run a women's leadership program in the Danger of Job Centre, which is where it makes sense to do women's prison. And um, that program is in um, conjunction with a couple of other services where we go and we talk with women around strategies for overcoming criminal record discrimination for primary leaders because it's a massive issue. It's a, it's a way of entrapping women within the criminal justice system and, and you know, having a very little chance for white people of being able to um, escape that. Um, it's been described as a pastoral state, the extension of the pastoral state to criminal record discrimination. It's not only work, it's labour. Yeah, no one wants to leave. You can know where they're going to church in New Zealand. And 
mission, removal, incarceration, all the genealogies of our sons and siblings. And then look at non-Aboriginal children, you know, from convict children being placed on Terra Island through to, you know, the removal of um, working class children and placing them in institutions through immigration schemes for forgotten Australians, through to the, the mass victimisation of children in institutional and church care. We've seen a horrific punishment and silencing and invisibility of children that, that must have a culture of punishment for labels, you know? And particularly in Bendigo, you know, in the last few years, you've seen men for the first time talk about their long histories of victimisation at the hands of politicians. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some of those men, so they keep in prison. And some of those men are in prison. You know, but the, the, the mentality, the collusion and complicity of the most powerful institutions of church and state in this country to allow that to happen happened in the context of a culture of community care and a culture of silencing and forgetting. You know? And then when you look at, you know, the raw, the, 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 the legacy of the Royal Commission, that has also occurred in the, not just a culture of forgetting, but a, a deliberate culture of dismembering, disremembering the, the, the causes and the consequences of, you know, mass incarceration around the city. Because, you know, prison fundamentally for Aboriginal people is a proto-genocidal institution. You know, that's why, you, you know, Month after month, you're getting people die in, in conditions of lethal indifference. And that will continue as long as prisons are used as the predominant proto-genocidal response to the community of people. Thanks, Shane. Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid. Really, really quick. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, the, the last thing to do is, is to formally thank the, uh, the presenters today for, for their magnificent work and, uh, and 